this is more sort of a, um, a sort of exploration of an idea we've been pushing for a while um, that's cropping up in different places. It's a bit of a portmanteau talk. Um, there is a unifying idea, which is this. Um, um, but uh, I'll give you some examples. Some of them I'll be very brief about, but there is one large chunk which um, is a little bit of a horror story with regard to hardware, but it's the main part of the talk. Anyway, let's see how it goes. So the context of, of this sort of work that we're doing here is uh, looking at modern hardware. And when, you know, back in, in the old days when people like me and Stefan were writing operating systems for our PhD thesis, hardware was really quite nice and simple. Um, and it isn't really like that anymore, um, which is sort of one of the reasons that not many people write operating systems anymore. Um, computers these days are systems with lots of cores and lots of devices. The devices are quite complex and so on. So these things basically have very complicated interconnects. Even phones have pretty complicated interconnects now. There's a lot of latency between nodes to the extent that this actually affects the performance of your programs and affects the performance of your operating system. There's a bunch of heterogeneous cores. Um, this is going to get worse as we start running out of um, power budget and we start having to specialize cores, things like that. Um, and then there's also this problem here, which is that if you buy two different machines these days, even if they're PCs, you may get wildly different hardware configurations inside them. If you start working with big enterprise software manufacturers or um, other kinds of large companies, you realize that what they're doing is actually building quite large pieces of hardware, sometimes as a way to package their software. And that inside these things, you get even more bizarre sets of um, hardware configurations, distributions of memory, maybe parts of the memory are coherent, maybe parts of the memory are not. And if you're trying to write an operating system, which is pretty general, and uh, when it runs on all these things, you have to deal with a, a really quite terrifying array of different kinds of hardware. Um, of course, this hardware comes and goes. People plug things in, people unplug things, things fail, and things get brought up and taken down for power management reasons. And as I said, there may be fairly limited shared memory, or there may not be much cash here, and if you don't know, it depends on the machine at hand. Um, this is a fairly familiar set of observations about the way hardware is going. And hopefully this is not too sort of controversial. Um, a few years ago, we started worrying about this, um, or viewing it as a research opportunity, which is code for worrying about it. Um, we decided to build an operating system. You may have heard of called Barrelfish. Um, we decided to start from scratch because we thought we'd like a clean slate. And I'd just been given a tenured position in Zurich, so I thought, hey, you know, nobody's going to tell me not to do this. Uh, I had some funding for it. It's worked with Microsoft in, uh, in Cambridge. It's open source, you can download it. Um, we targeted a mix of sort of untrusted applications, general purpose operating system, but it's designed to run on a whole bunch of hardware that we do not know in advance. And for scale, we tried to limit the scope of the hardware that we were aiming at. So we wanted something that was no smaller than a cell phone and no bigger than a data center. Um, within that, we were fairly open-minded. In practice, our office is actually a little bit smaller than that bracket. Um, we wanted to target a variety of hardware platforms. We wanted an operating system that worked well in different scenarios. Okay. And so the specific, um, some of these problems we decided um, implied that we didn't really want to have an operating system that was based on shared memory. So things like Linux and Windows are based on <coughs> essentially the kernel of, of Windows, the kernel of Linux is a big shared memory multi-thread program. And we felt that this didn't work in this kind of world. Heterogeneous cores, not necessarily shared memory in the um, So we built the operating system as a distributed system based on message passing. It looks like a multi-kernel. There's an SOSP paper on this. I'm not going to talk very much about this. Um, but um, this was the sort of the operating system structure we ended up with. You notice that it doesn't actually address some of the other kind of problems that we felt were characterizing the space. And so this is a talk about multi-core multi operating systems, but it's not a talk about scalability. It's not a talk about how to deal with a very large number of cores. This is really a talk about complexity. Right? And it's a talk about how to deal with a very complicated interconnect in a machine, a set of heterogeneous cores connected by that interconnect, and a structure that you don't necessarily know in advance. You can't really tailor the operating system to a 
particular kind of machine because that machine hasn't necessarily been built yet. Uh, one of the things that, that, that sort of panicked us was it's pretty clear now that hardware is changing faster than system software changes. Back in the old days, it was great. You know, DEC would bring out a new machine and we all said, oh, yeah, how do we write our operating system for this? And we'd sit down for a few years and we'd get it right and that would be fine. Um, Intel are cranking out a new sort of microarchitecture every couple of years now, and that's just too fast to be able to adapt operating systems for. So how do we deal with all this complexity? How do we keep the operating system and the applications we want to run efficient on a wide variety of these machines that we don't know about it on? So here are some of the problems that come up with here, and these are the ones that I'll talk about in very levels of detail. So we want to coordinate tasks running on calls, so we have a group communication problem. Maybe you want to send messages between calls, maybe you want to send interrupts between calls, but because we don't know what sort of calls we've got, we don't know how they're connected, how we do this efficiently. We want to understand memory, numeral aware memory allocation, but also make sure that the memory we allocate can be read by the calls that actually need to read it. We want to be able to aware of the performance implications of allocating memory in particular parts of the system. And that leads on to things like spatial scheduling, how do you place threads on calls, uh, how do we worry about cache sharing, Sometimes you really want to share cache, so you want to co-locate threads. Sometimes you don't want to share cache. You want to have as much cache available as possible in disjoint access, so you, you want to keep the threads apart. How do you know? Uh, and then what turned out to be um, an alarmingly big problem, which is what Lola talks about, which is how to configure device hardware um, with modern standards for, for hardware architecture. So what does the operating system need to know to deal with these kinds of problems? Okay? So the operating system needs to know what its own requirements are in terms of um, performance kind of policies the operating system needs to, to enforce. It needs to know what sort of application requirements there are. It needs to know what the machine looks like in hopefully as detailed a way as possible. And it needs to know what the kind of particular performance trade-offs the machine gives you actually are. And the problem we have is that we don't know these when we design the operating system. We we might know what the operating system requirements are. We don't really know what the application requirements are. In particular, we don't know what the machine characteristics and performance trade-offs are. In the old days, that was fine. You just guess. These days, what people do for things like Windows and Linux is they pick a set of machine designs and say, we're going to run really well on those. And we, at least for the purposes of research, decided that, that was something we wanted to really tackle. So a consequence of this is that you actually need to... Mahdi, is, yeah? is the issue there that there is too big a range of machines that... Yes. There is too diverse. Drive, or that you simply don't know what the future will hold? It's both. But the immediate problem, which yes, there's a sort of spatial problem, which is right now there are just too many weird-ass machines out there for us to be able to tune the operating system to run well on all of them. Um, but in the future, these machines are changing quite rapidly, and people are producing ever more complex machines and we want to be able to do with that as well. To what extent do vendors get impressed into doing this, this tuning? Since it seems, in some sense, that is, in, their incentives are aligned with making Windows or Linux or whatever the operating system that's commercially important for them work really well. Yeah, so there's a sort of tension, which is that if you're building a PC board, you, know, you want to be able to innovate in that space, but you want to make sure that that's not going to result in um, you know, really bad performance, so things like Linux and Windows. And what that's actually doing is constraining the extent to which you, know, you can really radically innovate in the design of a PC. Um, but in the space of things like appliances or large-scale embedded systems, they don't care about that. Um, but what they do care about is, is getting the performance. So the people we've talked to say, well, you know, yes, we're trying to wedge Linux or Windows or half a dozen embedded operating systems space into this machine and then how many do we need to run, do we need to be at break this machine. So they're actually much more, they have a different approach to this kind of tension of what does the hardware do and that's what we're doing. Um, so in an abstract kind of way, we need to interpret all this information that we only really acquire at runtime. We actually need to interpret that in the operating system and make some decisions that hopefully allow the operating system to do the right thing, not our actually applications to do the right kind of thing. And the way that this is done is you kind of expose stuff like operating system, well, hardware configuration stuff will end up in Linux, for instance, as SIS or DevFus or you know, Windows, there's a whole load of registry entries that try to capture something about what the machine looks like. Um, 
And there's a lot of user level stuff like running CPU ID on a regular basis, things. And you write a whole load of complicated C to make sense of this. And that C, uh, if you look at how, for instance, some of the numeric intrinsics libraries that try to do numerical computations fast, um, this is really quite complex C. If you look at how device programming is done, particularly things like PCI configuration that I'll talk about, this is quite frighteningly complex C. It's very pretty code. When the hardware changes and it has a case that the C can't handle, there's a complicated round trip through some developers and there's a whole load of bugs get introduced and, and, and things like that. So what we wanted to try and do is to say, because we were writing an operating system, do we want to do this, given that Microsoft seemed to have enough trouble getting this right, and Microsoft told us they had enough trouble getting this right, do we want to try and replicate all that effort with one professor, four grad students, opposed to and a couple of Microsoft researchers? The answer was no. Um, and is there any way that we can actually make this easier to deal with for us? Um, and then by doing so, make it easier to sort of deal with the problem more generally. So we didn't want to do this. So what do we want to do instead? Well, we made an observation, which is, if you're writing an operating system, you've got really got two different requirements. You've got a sort of mechanism-based requirement that says, you want to have data structures that actually guide the execution of the system. Those data structures should be efficient, they should be small, they're specialized for the particular architecture you're on if you want it to go fast, um, and they're typically coded in C. There's a different requirement, which is you want to represent the state of the system as much, because you want to be able to base policy on what you know about the system. So you want data structures that are rich, they're self-describing, they give you most policy flexibility, um, and you want to make them easy to evolve as new hardware comes along and new application requirements come along. For most operating systems, these two structures are actually the same thing. And perhaps this is not the right way to do it. When they are split up, you sort of derive these from here. It turns out that, well, these still end up being written in C. And you think, you know, if you actually just look at these requirements and forget about those, these requirements, you think, is C the right language to represent a whole load of information about the system as a basis for determining high-level policy decisions? Now, operating systems people might think, yes, C is obviously the right way to do that. Very few other people think that way. Maybe we're just a weird bunch. So C is a dreadful policy language. So what could we do? So we decided to just sort of, well, let's go to the other extreme. We started reading papers about the semantic web. Um, that was interesting. Um, we did not do what the semantic web does, I should say that right now. Um, but People who have addressed this problem in networking, management of complex systems, all this kind of stuff, they have a high-level declarative language that specifies what you know, what kind of policies you've got. You want to represent system state as much detail as possible and then provide these kind of abstractions on top that are very flexible. Um, and you want to be able to reason about the system online. And this is actually not too radical, you know. Management systems, computer networks, and indeed the semantic web is sort of at heart. Partly this is this sort of idea. Why don't we try that inside an operating system? So, Barofish has a theme called the System Knowledge Base. It's a service. Uh, it boots pretty early in the system. Uh, it boots before we configure the PCI bus on the PC. Um, it holds lots of stuff we can find out. I'll go into more detail in a moment. We can query it from the operating system, we can query it from applications, and it tries to be as helpful as possible in the facilities it provides. There are plenty of design options for doing this. If you are a semantic web person, then you're really excited by things like uh, description logics. Um, if you really can't face description logics, maybe you'll fall back to RDF at a pinch. Um, a lot of this stuff comes from sort of this field of knowledge representation from um, many years ago, sort of ATT and people like that. Yeah? What is RDF? Uh, resource description format. It's a it's a little bit, expressively, it's a little bit like sort of prologue or relational calculus. It's that sort of level of, of stuff in the lattice of kind of logics and things like that. Um, description logics are rather more powerful and rather less tractable computationally. Satisfiability in here is sort of just about decidable, but you know, this is at the edge of decidability and then you get to personal logic, which is not right. Um, uh, we picked a bunch of these things, um, not all of them. It was a fairly arbitrary decision at the time. It was largely because we got somebody pointed us at this 
constraint logic programming system called Eclipse that we decided to use as an initial try. This gives us logic programming, essentially it's a prologue engine. It's got constraint um, addition, uh, extensions to it, and it can do optimization. This was actually written a long time ago, back in the 90s. This was written for a network management system. They wrote an entire network management system out of constraint prologue. Um, and it's now open source, and so we thought, well, let's try that. We'll do a quick port of that, see what we can do. Um, I'll return to this later. I think, you know, these days you'd want to go for something like Satisfy Virtual Modular Theory. There's some really good SMT solvers out there, like Z3, that do pretty much everything we do, but way faster, uh, and in a way much nicer, more customizable way. Right? So what goes in? What do we put into this thing? We put in everything we can find about the machine. We do a lot of resource discovery. Standard stuff that we get in Smash this on Nerds all goes in there as knowledge facts, knowledge representation framework facts. We do a load of online hardware profiling. So we look at it, um, latency for intercore communication, memory persistent performance, all this stuff. All those micro benchmarks you get, we run and the operating system starts up. And that all goes into the system. Bits of operating system state, long-term operating system state, state that doesn't necessarily uh, change very, very frequently, but is nevertheless important, like, which cores processes are running on, this sort of thing. And then things we just know. We can assert things that we've typed in from data sheets and put into files in the system. Well, your profile in here is kind of, are going to be baseline kinds of measurements. You're not trying to infer things where there's this complex state in the microprocessor, like the right. trying to get buffer after it's half full, does something different. No, obviously there's a limitation to this, but it's things like what is an L2 miss, what's an L3 miss, uh, how much does it cost to fill the L2 from an L2 or another package, that sort of stuff. Yeah. But not the kind of, the, maybe the details of the microarchitecture. We haven't had any input in that in this point. That we will leave up to the people who write intrinsic libraries and things like that. Um, so examples of this. I'm going to give three sort of small examples, and I'll give a big example. The big example is quite funny. Um, I think it's quite funny. But then I've been through it, and I've come out the other side, and it's that sort of <gasps> euphoria, uh, having finished it. Um, this one um, actually was an original um, SOSP paper. This is how to do a one-phase commit across cores. We use shared memory for message passing in Barrowfish, but the sort of same principle applies to various other things. It is just a one-phase commit, you know. You send a message out to everybody, find out when everybody's got the message. Right. You can use this for things like cache and validate. This is a basic cache and validate operation. You want to know when, the, when everything's gone from the cache. So if you want to send messages between calls, latency matters. Here is some measurements for this uh, big old machine we've got, which is a sort of um, eight socket AMD machine. It's just sort of an example of what you might get, but here are the kind of figures you get. So 75, yeah, it's about 30, 38 times slower to go to L3 than it is to go to L1. If you want to go to somebody else's L1 or L2, you're taking 65 times the cost of hitting in your own L1 cache. And then you've got different um, access for other caches goes up as you go for more hops across this kind of hypertransport network up here. This is one machine, okay? So this is the one particular machine that the operating system is booted on. How do you actually send, you know, how do you do an efficient one-phase commit across this machine, depending on which socket you start on, how do you get to all the cores and then get messages back, okay? So how would you send messages using shared memory? Well, you can do it in various ways. You could do this unicast thing. So you write, you write your message into a whole load of cache lines that are shared between the sender and each receiver pairwise. Okay, so the senders read out of this, these mailboxes and the sender writes into them. Maybe these are ring buffers, maybe they're single locations. It doesn't really matter too much uh, for the purposes of this. Um, you think, well, is that the fastest way to do it? Surely you could just broadcast. Right? So you just write into one big shared cache line, everybody reads out of that, lots of resharing, works out pretty nicely. It turns out on this machine, uh, it's not quite what you think. So use the broadcast approach, uh, you get this sort of scaling because you get a lot of contention for the memory interconnect. This machine, I should say, doesn't have directory-based cache coherence, broadcast cache coherence, which really shouldn't have with eight sockets. Um, but that's what they sold us at the time. Um, so if you unicast and you use separate message channels for each core, you get slightly better performance, but the scaling still kind of sucks. That was interesting, yeah? Are you decide on the inner communication between cores? That's, I'll come to. Okay. okay. 
So that, that in a sense, yeah. I mean, here, here are two ways to do it. Right. Right. This, this one is one way, this is another way to do it. Uh, maybe we could be smarter. So maybe we do this. So we notice there are packages, and going to package is expensive. And a small cost package. So what if we send something to one core in each package, and then that re multicast stuff to the other three cores in the package? So we have this tree now. Maybe that's actually faster. Okay. In fact, maybe we can do something even better than this, which is that we, given that we know how many hops away each package is, if we send a message to the furthest away package first, it'll start doing its stuff and congesting its own interconnect while we can send something to the closest package, and then we'll get the messages back in total a lot faster. Okay? Turns out this actually works. So you get a pattern like this. This is an execution trace um, with a sort of instrumentation tool that Microsoft wrote for us. So this is running on our page. You can see the messages, right? Everybody's sending messages to these different cores. We get messages back. You get this kind of very characteristic sort of, this is, a, this is the sort of the aggregation tree, and then everything comes back to the sending core here. And this works really well. So here's the straightforward, let's, yeah, two level multicast tree goes here. And you can see the sort of steps where you're going off, you, know, you have another package that you have to go to, another socket you have to go to. But if you actually schedule it in the right way, you do them in the right order, so you go to the furthest socket first and then the closest ones, it's really good. You actually get almost, almost constant cost as the number of calls goes up, which is actually not bad at all. Now, the question is, this is done on, you know, that particular machine. What well, if I got another machine? Would it look like this now? It would look a little different, right? And, and the whole sort of very carefully crafted code that I've, you know, implied exists that, that sends messages to the right cores at the right time and works out where you are in the interconnect. So it works out which, which cores are furthest away and everything. That's obviously tricky code to write. Alternatively, you can do this. So that's, that graph was actually generated using this. Now this, I'm not going to persuade you that this is immediately intuitive to any sort of regular um, programmer. This is constraint prologue. Um, many of my students run away screaming the first time they see this, but, but eventually they get used to it. The point is it's not much code. Okay. And I think a better query language here would do a much better job of expressing this. I'm not selling this as the, uh, as the future of this. This is the sense of the past and any sort of stuff. But this is a fairly simple piece of code that works on pretty much any hardware and will generate what we expect to be a pretty much an optimal, or very close to optimal, multicast tree of arbitrary depth and a schedule for which cause to send messages to first and which cause to delay until later in order to get that sort of aggregation working as fast as possible. And the nice thing about it is that this is what the OS uses in order to build the tree that generates the graph, the, 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 um, the really good looking graph that, that, that I showed you on the previous slide. Yeah? So do you have the notion of how constrained you are by what metrics you decide to measure early on? So if there's some you know, weirdness in my interconnect that makes this mm -hmm. delay dependent on something weird. Um, we are. Um, what we've done essentially is made our model, our representation of the machine, way more flexible than it was before. But it's obviously not going to capture absolutely everything. In particular, there is a sort of implicit schema that we've picked. Now, that's where Prolog is going to define the schema in advance. But if another piece of hardware came along that had an interconnect, I mean, I, I, I can't think of one offhand, but I can imagine that there might be a machine where our measurements would not provide enough information for this item to run, at which point we'd need to go off and say, well, OK, what, we need to do more measurements when we boot. And we need to somehow add that information into a form that this thing can make sense of. And if we do that, the nice thing is, though, that you don't need to change this by you know, the magic of logic programming. We can simply write inference rules that take this new information that doesn't fit our previous schema. Effectively, you've got, you know, you're using, the you know, database people would call this logical data independence. We can interpret that data in the context of this query in a way that means we don't need to change this particular query. But it is a very good point. Yeah, this is not a silver bullet, but it does make the job an awful lot easier for us. Yeah? This prolog code looks pretty good to me. Are you saying that you think there might be other programming languages that would make writing this type of program much easier? Um, I think. 
I'm not sure it would get shorter. I think it might be easier to understand. I mean, I, I, I don't have too much of a problem with prologue, but then I, I don't, fortunately, don't get to write a lot of it, and, and my students write more of it. Um, some of them grumble about it, some of them don't. Um, I think the syntax of this could perhaps be specialized to our application, um, particularly given some of the other applications we have. I mean, I suppose prologue is it's so simple. Yeah. That, that, that you know you can build all these solitary structures, but the cost of that is that sometimes it's a bit opaque. Yeah. I mean, uh, Prolog is not familiar to most programmers, and it's not taught in most undergraduate degrees. Mm -hmm. But it is a very small and simple language. It is a very small and simple language, um, and so I guess that there is a design debate as to do I want a, a richer, more complex, more typeful language that you need to find out more about the type system about, but maybe easier to write these kind of queries. Um, I don't really know. I mean, you could say, I think. If we went down the route of saying, let's replace this system with an SMT solver, we would want a language, we probably want to design a language, and I'm guessing the language might be semantically similar to Prolog, but would we'll probably have a different sort of syntax. The, the big controversy, I think, here is unification. Some people really don't like unification, and they want something that's more SQL. Um, I don't mind unification, but it's, um... Oh, yeah? Um, so in this previous example, I think this is kind of related to Steve's question, but the, the schedule you produce yep. is sort of quite static. I mean, the roots of things aren't changing. And I guess you could detect uh, those situations, you know, if you have a hardware configuration change, you yep. produce a new schedule or whatnot. Yes. But what about things that change frequently? I mean, if you're doing, yep. if, you're, if you're running unification every, you know, second or something. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, we, there's a point where things are changing sufficiently fast and the SKV does not help you. So could you learn, a, could you solve, instead of for the static schedule for some function, essentially, that would be an efficient way of... Well, since you generate a function which is which is efficient to evaluate. Mm -hmm. you know, we could, we haven't looked at that. Um, that would be an interesting question. I mean, maybe the, I suspect our solver would not be good at generating that, but if you used a faster declarative language like Mercury or something, then perhaps you could, you're essentially currying up everything except for the stuff you already know with, uh, context switch time. Have you run into any situations where that would be useful to date or? Um, it's more a case that we have avoided situations where that has been a problem. Fair enough. So a couple of very simple examples, smart memory allocation as well. Um, so libnuma, if you use libnuma or sort of things like that. Libnuma works most of the time. It tells you where the machine um, memory banks are versus cores. It gets it wrong sometimes when a new machine, when a new or design comes out, or a new chip architecture comes out. Um, with the SKB, we can do this kind of stuff. This is an example that we did. We have this shared scan console database stuff which runs on top of Barfish um, and the Linux. And what it wants to know is basically where the NUMA nodes are because it wants to set up its partition to data and memory and run them efficiently. And so I'm not going to go into the details of that because I don't really have time. But um, it turns out that if you do this fairly simply, um, you end up with obviously memory in the wrong place. This isn't exactly new. And you get a lot of memory pressure in parts of the memory system and, and almost nothing somewhere else. Um, if you do it sensibly, you do this. You can do this with Linuma. For us, we did this with a, you know, a, actually a, a really very simple um, query of the SKB saying, where is the physical memory that I'm interested in? Barofish has a way of allocating physical memory rather than sort of virtual memory, and then you do self okay. Um Another very brief example before I get on to the sort of the, the big one is placing threads for cache scheduling, the same example. Um, if you've got, say, four threads, you've decided you want to use four threads and you're on a particular piece of hardware, maybe you want to co-locate threads because you want to share cache. Um, share a sort of L2 cache between, or an L3 cache between a bunch of threads on the same package. Or maybe you don't because you don't want to thrash the cache because you've got a, a larger working set. So you want to have these threads in disjoint packages where they're not interfering with each other. If you're doing, say, a database joint, it turns out in many cases, that this really does affect, depend a lot on the selectivity of the of the join um, that you have in the database. If you're doing a join with sort of very high selectivity, then perhaps you want to have cache locality. If it's low selectivity, you don't. What you want to do is to sort of maximize the, the amount of cache you've got. So, given you know, what the query optimizer knows you can do, right, you can actually go off to the, the SKB and say, where should I be? You know, given what you know about the size of my caches, how do I allocate things? I've got a Magnicores machine, I go like this. But if I'm on a different machine, like a Halem, it looks like this. 
Um, but on some machines, it looks, you know, on the, say, the, the Barcelona machine I saw earlier, it doesn't actually matter. And it says, no, 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 it doesn't give, you, you don't want to share caches on this machine because the cache traffic on the same package is so expensive. And the same query will generate different layouts here from, from the previous kind of uh, examples. And likewise, uh, if you're on a, say, just a, um, a four socket machine here, what it does is it only fills up two cores on each package when you want maximum, uh, or when you want isolation, it turns out that if you've got a preference for cache sharing, it will actually um, spread things out as before, but here it won't fill up the whole package because it doesn't think that it's got enough cache to actually avoid thrashing in that situation. And again, this is just one query that does it. The database just issues this query to the SKB, places its threads accordingly, or it requests that kind of affinity. And you get pretty good performance from doing that. What I really wanted to talk about, though, was is doing PCI bridge configuration, which sounds very boring. And um, but if you think about it, what we've done so far is not really exercise a full-on sort of constraint satisfaction kind of uh, situation. We haven't really um, pushed sort of what things like Prolog or, or SMT solvers can actually do. Um, we wrote an operating system. We wrote it from scratch. You want to run on PCs, one of the things you've got to do on PC is config configure a PCI bus. Who has actually written PCI configuration code? Anyone done this? Anybody looked at the spec? No? Oh, right. yeah. Um, prepare to be frightened. It sounds so simple, right? The problem is this. Configure the PCI peripheral devices in a peripheral <coughs> right? right? This one. Okay? What you need to do is to allocate to every device device. I'm going to be pretty free and loose with PCI jargon here, so if you're a real PCI purist, then you know, I'm going to confuse functions and devices and stuff. Um, but allocate to each device the regions of physical address space it needs to communicate to itself. Okay? That's all you've got to do, right? Tell the machine, what devices have I got? Give them the right address ranges. How hard can it be? So PCI is this sort of electrical standard. Um, but the key thing here is that it's, um, it is this software visible interface to IO hardware. It is specified as a document that tells you what every device that implements PCI does or should do. Logically, PCI is a tree, but it's a tree that is addressed using a flat physical address space, because that's what the CPU is things out. So what happens is that each PCI bridge here translates physical addresses into some range along its bus. Some of the devices on this bus might be SPS controllers, NICs, graphics, whatever. Some of them might be bridges which themselves translate the address ranges for the bridge into other address ranges for other devices downstream. So it's a tree and it maps onto a linear physical address space. So every PCI device actually asks for a set of address ranges. As I need 16 kilobytes for some set of registers, 2 megabytes for this other set of registers, whatever. Physical address space is either 32-bit or 64-bit, you get both. Um, there's also the I.O. address space, if you're on PC, it's usually 16 bits. So you've got two address spaces here, and in fact it turns out that memory space is actually divided into two separate address ranges, one of which is prefetchable, one of which is not prefetchable. Okay. And then bridges of the tree remap these addresses, so you have to program all your devices, tell it which addresses they should live at, in such a way that you can access all the registers and all the devices in the system. PCI devices are self-describing, which is a nice feature. So what you get in particular is the address <coughs> that they want. How much memory does each one have? So you query each device, and you can query each device before you've configured it, which is happening. So each device has these address registers, or six of them. Forgive the gory details, but this is kind of a, the gory details are in a sense the point of this. Each device has up to six base registers. Each specifies a region in one of these three address spaces. Remember, not higher, might be much more not, might be less than a megabyte, it's a really old device, 32 bit, 64 bit. Um, the size is given by reading the register. So how big a region you need, you read the register. And then you, what you do is you write into the register the base address that it actually now sits at, relative to the bridge that sits above it, okay? So that when the bridge puts out an address, it just looks to see if it's 
between the base address and size, and that then it will actually you know, interpret that for us. So bridges are special devices. They aren't PCI devices, but they're special. They've got three bars, one for each type of memory region, and they define this new bus underneath it. Okay? Top level bridges are called root complexes. Um, high end machines typically have several root complexes. Um, and those themselves may sit at addresses that perhaps you can program, perhaps you can't program. So here's what you do. At startup, you find all your devices, you find the PCI or a complex, read its configuration, find all the attached devices, just enumerate all the devices. Step basically a breadth plus search and tree. Um, the bridge, you go down another level, get a list of all the devices in the system with their address based requirements. And then you find address ranges for each device and bridge. Um, you need to make sure the devices below bridge fit into its range. Every range has to be naturally aligned to parity. Okay. So 4K ranges have to be aligned on 4K boundary, 2 megabyte ranges on 2 megabyte boundary, and so on. And then you go down to each device and you write its bar, bar registers to create this um, configuration. So I'm going to give you a very schematic example. It's going to be one address space rather than three. And it's going to ignore all whole 64 bit, 32 bit things. I'm just going to use abstract numbers here. But to give you an idea of what to do, okay, we have one root bridge, several other bridges and devices. This is a sort of, I say it's very schematic, but it gives an idea of exactly what this problem is. Every computer, when it boots, has to solve this problem if it has a PCI bus. In initially, all the um, Addresses of all these devices are basically all sort of chaotic. The devices are not actually powered up, they're not actually active, thank goodness, otherwise there would be confusion when you access the memory in the region. First of all, you configure all the devices and establish the sizes of all the leaf devices, which is the, um, the particular um, the devices that are not bridges. You need to work out how big they all are, so 4, 4, 16, 32, and so on. Make sure that siblings don't overlap. Obviously, you don't want devices underneath the same bridge to actually overlap, so you need to make sure that you program the ranges so that nothing is actually overlapping like this. Then you need to naturally align all the devices. You need to make sure that the, the, the addresses of all these devices occur on the right boundaries. So if it's a size 16, it's got to be at a boundary of sort of 16. Okay? So maybe it looks like this. You've got to make sure that all the bridges decode the entire address range that their children need. Okay, so you've got to extend where the bridges go. Okay. Then you've got to make sure that the range decoded by the bridge actually fits into the range that the root bridge can decode. The root bridge has a limited range of address codes that it can actually decode. So up here, wherever we've gone off the end, we can't actually get at these registers here, even though this bridge can decode them because the root bridge isn't going to allow this address to get through to this bridge. Okay, so maybe we need to rearrange them. Okay, and move that one over there, perhaps, which means we need to move the whole bridge over and rearrange things. That looks a little bit better. So now we've got to move these around because we've got to get this back over here because otherwise we can't fit this bridge in anymore. So let's rearrange that. And we've got success. Right? Now, this is not the way you'd actually do it, but these are the constraints on the problem. Right? This is actually how you'd have to. This is the sort of, this is a, a well configured PCI bus. Okay, now we can actually access all the devices, everything's at the right addresses, they're all nicely aligned. Right? So far, so good. This is a non trivial problem to do, but you can do it in n log n time. Um, one way to do this, you sort devices by descending alignment granularity, post order traversal, um, really allocate the aligned devices largest first, and that will give you a configuration if it's possible. Great. Okay? Seems useful. Oddly enough, the PCI specification does not tell you this. It doesn't actually say how you configure a PCI device. You'd think that a document about this thick, costs a lot of money from the PCI consortium, would actually tell you what you needed to do, tell you what code you needed to write. It does not. And um, possibly because it doesn't work. It doesn't work for a bunch of very annoying problems. So, some devices can only set at fixed addresses kind of screws up the first order traversal the that again. Keyboard controllers, video cards um, that use file simulation, particularly the Apex, the 
the, the interrupt controllers, often can only sit at particular addresses. They're hardwired to sit at a particular physical address, which means that you have to program all the bridges to make sure that something actually sits at this address. So for example, this device here might be an APIC. So it has to sit at address zero, because otherwise it's not going to work. And there's too much other stuff in the platform that assumes that APIC is at that particular address. So we've got to move all that stuff around, you've got to rearrange all this kind of stuff again. And then you've got to rearrange that bridge, because you've got to extend it, it's no longer a line, and then maybe we're back to normal again. So we have the in general yes. for arbitrary constraints that include specific physical addresses with mm -hmm. sub-bridges. It cannot be solved. It can be solved. Well, okay, okay the making of a scenario you cannot satisfy. There are many cases where it is, yeah. We haven't actually seen anything like that yet. Well, it could have been done mm -hmm. for someone to do that. But it's but clearly, well, but of course, all these things are plugged in. So you can imagine plugging in a device, and the thing says, "Wow, you know, because this device is asking for an impossible." I have to be at the top of memory, and it's sitting with something that says I need to be at the bottom of memory. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. And if you call first line technical support, they will not understand what you're talking about. So it gets worse. So it turns out that this address space actually has holes in it. Okay. So there are addresses that can't actually be used in devices, but they're in the range decoded by the root complex. You can work out where these holes are. You have to work out where these holes are by reading data sheets or looking at the ACPI tables that are left in the machine for your benefit and uh, entertainment by the BIOS when the machine clears. Okay? So there's a hole perhaps, right? There's an IO8 pitch, for instance, which is not a PCI device, but sits in an address which is inside the range that's decoded by the PCI root complex. So maybe it sits here. Um, and you know, it's got to be there because power management uses it. So you know, you've got to rearrange all this kind of stuff. And now we've got a hole inside the spot. And then there are the quirks. Okay. Yeah. So are the holes required uh, because they should not be used, or they just because the the holes, space is constraints you cannot? The platform says don't put anything here. Reserve this address. You cannot fill this address with any devices. Okay. Yeah. And maybe it gives a reason. Maybe it doesn't. Okay. Sometimes it's because there's, there's a non-PCI device that's there. Sometimes it's because they say, no, that just doesn't work. So can it also occur because of alignment to satisfy the alignment requirement? Oh, no, well, yeah, when you actually configure the bus, you will get padding, generally. Okay. Yes, yeah. But no, but that's not required whole. This yeah. is uh, something that a priori, the system tells you, this is reserved. Don't, don't allocate anything here, even though it's in the middle of the, the rest of the bus. Okay. So then there are quirks. So if you go off and, you know, there's more than 3,000 lines of Linux, that, of C in Linux, that actually details quirks, which are devices that don't quite do the right thing. And they have these wonderful comments associated with them. Yeah, right? So, um, you know, this one, for instance, where it really just gets the, gets the whole thing hopelessly wrong. Um, this card decodes a response to addresses not apparently assigned to it. That's useful, okay. Um, S3, 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 S3. report a region size equal to 52 megabytes, but they actually decode 64 megabytes. And you're just supposed to know this. Okay. Here's an interesting one. And this is not on every PC. It's on very particular chipsets. Turns out that there is a device that contains a lot of the legacy PC stuff, like timer, the old timer and the uh, UARTs and things like that. The first bar is the location of the IO APIC, but you're not allowed to touch it. You can't program that bar. Right? It does give you an address, but you can't change the address. So you can't move this device. Um, so you have to you know, keep this as it is. So, so now we have this immovable device in here. And then it has another five bars, but you can't actually touch those. Even though they look like they're valid address ranges and they're requesting things, they're requesting weird values. And in practice, they're never used. So you mustn't actually do it. So there's huge numbers of special cases. There are thousands of special cases. And all these special cases mean that a clean imperative algorithm for allocating on this space just doesn't work. Okay. And then there's hot plug. So this thing can change online. So not only that, you've got this nice allocation, and then somebody unplugs something, unplugs something else in, so you can unplug something else in, wants a bunch more devices. What do you do? Can you rearrange things? Well, you can't rearrange things without powering them down or shutting them down. Which means you've got to tell the other drivers in the system that, uh, sorry, can you just shut this device down for a moment, and then I'll bring it up at a different address, because I can fit things in. And so you've got to then got to you know, rejig the tree. You've got to minimize the amount to which you can rejig the tree, because that's, you say, you're closing down a load of devices. You're shutting down network connections, all kinds of things. 
Yeah. What is so special about these devices that they're allowed to exist and be non-compliant with the specs? The committee they are. are. <laughs> sure the, the, they are. They are shipping. Sure. Why were they allowed to? Like, who decided? Shouldn't have some OEMs take this, all this back? Or uh, they shipped a bunch, and then they shipped an errata sheet and said, oh, by the way, um, you know, uh, make sure you don't program it with this particular value. There are some devices where they're fine, unless you program them in a particular address, and if you program them in a particular address, they go completely fine. And what way. they basically said, the, the hardware manufacturers just said to Microsoft, oh, just deal with this, and Microsoft just sucked it up. There's a very fun book that has lots of little chapters called The New Thing that details um, all, the, all of the reasons that Windows is the way it is. And one of my favorite examples is with them finding computer game companies who have totally violated the um, spec for what you're allowed to access in the stack. So they access the stack, that's on parts of the stack that have been unallocated. And this didn't matter until they added stack protection. And they said, you need to fix this. And the game manufacturer said, that product shipped six months ago. We're not going to do anything. <laughs> so what? You're you never making money on that product again. Why would I waste a moment yeah. fixing it? Let's sell the hardware. What they're going to do? They're going to recall the hardware. So they've shipped maybe two million Ethernet cards at ten bucks a pop. Sure. So what do you do? Right? This had to be figured out before you got to ten million on the line, right? Uh, that's not very long, actually. <laughs> so I think Dan is asking, is there a verification process to to, be, to call yourself? That yeah, is it's, why it's It no. suggests a research direction in which one could design a spec mm -hmm. such that if by design it was easy to validate yeah. that you were compliant. But I mean, conformance testing is actually quite tricky. I mean, if you've got a device that it works fine unless the you know, two out of the top three bits of the address range are one, at which point there's an electric, analog electrical problem that means that this device doesn't work anymore. Right, conformance test suite for that is actually, that's tricky. Right? That's quite a large state space to explore there. So yeah, I mean, it, it's unfortunately, you know, this is a specific case of the general principle that the world is broken and, and we just have to deal with it. So uh, is it different for USB? Because I thought they have rules for, for the stickers. USB is a little bit different because the um, USB is essentially message based. Uh, but some USB devices don't implement all the right naming schemes and device reassignment and things like that, particularly things that do with legacy devices like keyboards. Um, there's a lot of special cases in USB. It's not as bad as PC. It's not really as bad as PC. The question is, look, you know, we're not the first to have hit this problem. Well, you know, what do people do? You know, and, and when we hit this problem, we thought, you know, okay, well, let's see what everybody does. Um, so most of it turns out they don't deal with this. So what Linux does is it, it just assumes the BIOS has got this right. And it's got a few cases where it runs a fix-up procedure for devices that the BIOS does not appear to have noticed. And mostly that works, and if it doesn't work, um, well, they give up. And uh, they don't support that. Okay, okay. forums. Hmm? That's why you have forums. That's why you have forums. Exactly. That's why you have forums. What well, if you've got this card? Tell me what the serial number is. Oh, well, if it ends at least they did is, you know, good luck to you. Let's just go back to best part by anyone. <laughs> See if you could open the box in the store and read the serial number. Um, so that's Linux, right? Um, Windows does actually does a much better job of this. Windows has a multi-level rebalance algorithm, which is quite a complicated piece of C, my friends at Microsoft tell me, that actually will move whole PCI bridges around the place in an attempt to fit a new device into the tree, or to fix up whatever the BIOS has done. Okay, um, consequence of this is that the machine may appear to freeze for a few seconds. And so sometimes when you plug a device into Windows, it'll go, ah, oh, yes, that's better now. And what's actually happened there is quite a lot of hardware devices have been powered down and then powered back on again just to fit them into the address, but I didn't realize it. Um, so much better job of doing it, but uh, also not. Um, there are IBM have a patent on how to program a PCI bus. Uh, IBM have patents on lots of things, but in 1998, PCI was quite old in 1998, but yes, they have a method for allocating system resources in the hardware industry. This is a recursive bottom-up algorithm. This, yeah, so I, they have a patent on how to program a device standard that had been out for about you know, so five or six years before this was okay. uh, People have published genetic algorithms to program PCI buses. Now, 
now, I don't know whether this says more about the genetic algorithms community or DCI bus design, but um, yeah, you can get, you know, <laughs> it wasn't just us who got two publications that had a program of DCI. Um, people have recently published genetic algorithms that try to optimally program PCI buses in the present time. Um, 18 years after PCI standardization, there is no complete solution. So what we did with the SKB was to say, let's actually set work here. Let's do all the, all the low level register access in C, because that's what C is good for. Um, and then what we do in we, we have an ideal layout algorithm that we express declaratively in Prolog um, that essentially is, is um, a rather more sort of declarative version of, of the basic kind of tree traversal kind of thing. It basically says, look, if everything's absolutely fine, um, here's what we do. And then the nice thing about this is that once you've got, so this is in Prolog, this is in C, there's a clean separation between these two. This is very easy code to understand, it's basically says again write this bar on this device. Um, this is, if you like, Prolog is relatively clean because it's, it, it just assumes everything's fine and everything works, and so this is the idealized solution. And then we add exceptions in separate code. Right? So extra constraints that screw up this algorithm are now separated out in the declarative specification, and that's the, you know, the benefit we get from using a constraint satisfaction approach to this problem. Um, and likewise, quirks and hardware folks are just extra things that say, yeah, you've got this algorithm, but don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Okay? So we can easily add things, and indeed, during the development of Verofit, when we got a new machine, we found ourselves adding new things. One of the, uh, the, uh, the fact that you know, the IO8 thing can't be moved, that appears as PCI bus, but the files are wrong, that was something that actually cropped up halfway through um, the way to the, um, the Aspos paper, and we had to fix it in the other paper. Um, and so the nice thing about this is that, that you can very easily incrementally add things without disturbing the algorithm. If you look at the way this is coded in things like Linux and BSD, it's full of special cases that make the algorithm very, very brittle. Um, and they're all threaded through the code. The nice thing about our code is that the expression of the problem is separated out from all the exceptions that you have to worry about. And we can actually take this code and run it on different platforms. Linux actually has different PCI programming code for Alpha and for MIPS and for x86 because it's all tied up with the hardware level of hardware access. We have all this stuff stays exactly the same. Um, and we do perhaps different low level register access code because the, the way the PCI bus is mapped into memory is different on some of these different architectures. But otherwise, yeah, we have the same algorithms for all these kinds of things. So it's a nice way of, 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 of addressing this problem. Um, and, you know, here are some examples. Here's a basic rule children can't overlap. Um, it's relatively easy to express as constraints. Um, we can say, don't move the device, is how you know, don't move this device. Um, you specify the device's keep original address, and then this code here makes sure that you can't do it. So um, if you have a device that can't be moved, you simply declare it as um, an instance of this particular predicate up here, and you're fine. Um, this is the other way paper, it's a bar and it's a hole. So it is the, um, the rule that does this. this was, so this is, I think, the most complicated exception we've had to add after we actually started writing the system. This was when the new machine arrived and, and we discovered this, this kind of bug. Um, did it work? Well, we actually used about 60% of the code that's in Linux to do full PCI configuration, which Linux doesn't even try to do. Um, and I think that if we had try to write all this stuff in C, um, replicate all the sort of the functionality uh, in C, we would never have been able to program PCI, which meant that our ability to run experiments on the operating system would be seriously diminished. Um, getting PCI working in the research operating system seems to be a challenge. I downloaded a bunch of other popular research operating systems in the last few years. None of them even try. What they do is that they simply know where the E1000 card is in the address space, where the files left it, and that's the thing they program. And so um, I feel actually quite, I feel quite good that we did engineer it. And I feel even better that we managed to get some publications out of it. Um, so the ideal problem is these are nicely separate from quirks. Uh, adding a new quirk is typically one to four lines of code. Um, and so um, it, it just, for us, you know, kind of crazy uh, that we boot an entire constraint solver before we even try to program the interconnection machine. But from the point of view of developing the system, 
in getting things working and supporting a variety of devices, this was actually actually on balance. Um, even the, the students who had to learn prologue to do this sort of feel that actually, yeah, this, this was the right thing to do. Yeah? Do you do hot plugging? We don't currently do hot plugging. We have an incremental algorithm which we've tested offline. But currently, we don't actually have any devices that do PCI hot plug. And so we kept with the, the offline, out, well, the, the one off from scratch algorithm. Um, what we have done is, is um, part of how we debug this was actually, we, we did debug this on Linux, which is that we did PCI dumps from every machine we could find around the department, and then ran them through the prologue offline, um, and developed the, the static algorithm that way. And we also, at the same time, did, a, did an incremental algorithm and we could simulate that with any things. The static algorithm has some heuristics to leave spaces for hot plug. So you know, it tries to minimize, but heuristics to minimize the reconfiguration you need when you hot plug. But um, what's in Barrelfish if you download it today and run it is actually the, the static algorithm. We haven't tested hot plug. Um, so what does this matter? I mean, this is PCI, right? Yeah. Yeah. Surely this is one particular case. Most of the quirks and problems we've seen have been on newer machines or older machines. So I think the problem is getting worse. And whenever we get a new interconnect, we get a new set of cores or a set of new sort of hardware features, they seem to always come accompanied by these kinds of problems. Right? And everybody does them. It's, you know, it's the very tiny manufacturers and it's people like Intel and AMD and, and, and IBM. And, and the problem is that I think this, this leads to a kind of brittle device design. It makes it hard to build correct system code because your code is laced with all these special cases that you need to handle hardware that does weird things. So hardware is typically specified assuming that everyone's going to follow the standard and everyone's going to implement it correctly, but it just doesn't happen. And hardware people really don't care very much about the effects on software of not doing this, because software is the easy stuff, right? You know, hardware, that's what real people do. Um, software, that's easy. And so it's okay if you make a little bit of mistake, because the software people can fix it. And so, this is very quick. Really, we think about the way we design network protocols. It's totally different. You know, the whole network, the robustness principle of network protocols, is the very antithesis of hardware design today. Right? Which is, you know, be you know, liberal in what you receive and strict in what you send. Exact words that John Post used. Um, so the conclusion is, you know, so far we built this thing. Was it actually worth it? I think that given that once we've got you know, porting this huge cryptic constraint solver into the, into the operating system at a very early stage of the boot process, that was a lot of work. But once we've done that, it saved us a lot of time to build extra stuff. And Barrelfish, compared with I think many research operating systems, is quite heavily engineered. Some would say way over engineered. And this has sort of, I think, saved us a little bit in being able to do that. Um, it certainly reduced a lot of the specific code that blows up later. We've had fewer unpleasant surprises on a new piece of hardware, and when, when they are, they usually change by one or two lines of prologue rather than having to rewrite a bunch of C. Um, and so this kind of, you know, when this does happen, it's kind of, why didn't you use the SKP to do this? This becomes this kind of, yeah, 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 should have used the SKP. And then the student says, yes. At that moment, the student is enlightened. <laughs> of course, you need to know prologue, and, and that's, and we, you know, this is heavy weight. This is about 64 megabytes of working set at boot time. Um, and you know, this is a lot of code. If you're trying to rely on the correctness of the OS, if you're a cell four person, you would never boot a load of hairy constraint satisfaction code and prologue interpreter um, and try and verify that, for instance. You know, so you know, there's a certain amount of faith here that this, that this code is correct. I mean, it's it's general purpose code. It's used all over the world in other sort of settings. So, but. It's definitely not bug free. The runtime's long, right? It takes us milliseconds to configure PCI versus microseconds. And of course, we have no constraints that say, you know, you can submit a query for the SKB and it could run for ages. And yes, you can kill it after a while, but it's not a totally satisfactory resource management solution. Yeah. Just to note, you wouldn't have to verify the solver. You just have to verify the correctness of a solution. So that problem is much more practical. That's true, actually. Yeah. So uh, I think that we might not be able to be able to make that. But that. That's actually a very good point. Um, yeah. It would, well, so if you wanted, yeah, but online, you would want to, maybe you can verify the correct service. So the solver itself is just a big yeah. black box. Yes. Um, okay. so if you want to do it offline, then you'd want to, you'd be worried about what the solver does. Online, as long as you've got some solutions, you can check about it. Then that's true. 
Uh, it's seductive to have one of these things, though. Like a hammer, everything starts to look like a nail. So we've got a paper of apps to this next week, which is uh, a student went off and built a name service and lock manager and um, synchronization service for Barrelfish block first. It looks basically it's chubby. It, it does for Barrelfish what chubby does for a, for a data center. It's not replicated, there's no Paxos going on in here at the moment. It's a centralized service. It sits on top of the SKB, basically puts a key value store under Prolog, and, we use, and, and that's used for all the dependency tracking we do for Stuffer. And it does device management, it does booting calls. As soon as a core appears, it goes into there, events get sent around. This is essentially debus on steroids with all the power of inference and constraint satisfaction behind it. Uh, it works great, um, but at some point, we are moving away from what the SKB is good at. And there's a tendency that everything falls into the SKB, and that's something I feel a little bit worried about, is that you know, when, when are we using this for an inappropriate kind of topic? Um, but that's, in a sense, part of the sort of the learning that you do when you do one of these sort of projects. I think we should also revisit our design. Right? Eclipse is a very old system. I think these days, you look at RDF, and you look at SMT as a better way, perhaps, of solving problems. Certainly, these things are way more efficient now than the rather clunky prologue to, to have got. Um, so I think you know we may redo it in this kind of sense. Um, but the high level message here I think is that you know machines these days are too complicated to manage and configure using C. I think you still have to program C, you have to write C for most of the operating system. We do, we're happy with it. But it's good for the low level fast stuff, it's specialized for the processor architecture, it's highly optimized, but all the rest, <coughs> you really want to sort of you know start you know, looking at the kinds of techniques that were developed in the 80s and 90s that are expressing these problems in a higher level language, as long as they're not that performance critical, um, better representations are a better way to actually structure the operating system. Um, so with that, I'm done, except for one slide that says that um, Zurich is a very nice place to live, and we are hiring. So um, feel free to uh, contact me, come and visit, or speak when you have positions open in uh, in systems, both for postdocs and system professors at tenure track. And um, obviously, I'm biased, but um, uh, Zurich is an absolutely wonderful city to live in. It's, it's a really gorgeous place. Please come visit. And that, and that. Thank you very much. Sorry about the run. So I can see this idea of kind of this reason for intelligence layer in terms of into operating system for display for the intelligence of Spark. Yeah. However, do you think it, when, let's say you have a failure, adding this kind of layer of reason will add a lot of cost in terms of diagnosis? A couple of reasons for that. One is that because previously everything is hard coded. So when you have a failure, you can determine this and say, okay, this is how the program executes, and why is executed this one. Right. But right now, it's based on tracing, it's based on this runtime providing information. Now, everything kind of becomes a black box. And secondly, it's because you use this power language. So power is nice because it's highly expressive. But the downside of the highly expressive language is that when you're talking and broken within this language, mm -hmm. it's more painful than a procedural language. Yeah, no, it's, a very, it's a very good point. Um, there's a number of, of possible things that can go wrong when you, when you do this. So, so um, if you have bugs, um, if you have bugs in Prolog, you're right, Prolog is not the easiest language to debug. Um, the advantage is that there's not much Prolog to debug. And it can be tested in isolation relatively nicely. Um, for us, we do have fewer bugs in the C. Because the C is typically very simple. It doesn't have this kind of policy and exception code and all kinds of other stuff in it. Now, C is actually much easier to understand. So uh, there is a trade off there. I'm not actually sure what, the, what that kind of trade off is, really. Um, but certainly, our C is way simpler and easier to understand for things like this than the C that you'd see in Linux and, and BSD. Because the, the stuff that's deep, the deep algorithm stuff, is just is part of the, the constraint service, the solver. And it's been very useful because we can test. The little bits of prolog and constraint solver offline, we can generate test sets for those very easily because they're separated out from the, the data. Um, we don't hatch, we don't deal with fault tolerance yet in Marafish, but that's you know that's on the trajectory. At some point, bits of hardware are going to fail, and then the question is, what does the operating system do? And everybody's going to have to face this sooner or later. Um, at this point, the architecture of the SKB is problematic because if the SKB fails. What do you do? Now, uh, for device configuration, you don't do anything. 
um, and it's, it's just not going to work. Um, for some of the stuff we use, like spatial scheduling, there is a default policy that the thing just says, just does, tries to do something local um, and sane. Um, but you know, that's not exactly a complete solution to the problem. Um, and this is, at the end of the day, a big centralized single-threaded service that may crash. And uh, yeah, we can restart it automatically. So there, there is a lurking issue there. Yeah? What's the interface between C and Prolog look like in your system? Um, so we've got, um, I don't think I've got a I'm going to show you what it is, but uh, essentially it's an RPC thing. It, it's, it is ludicrously unsafe. Basically, it's here is a, here's a query, give me back the results. Uh, there's a little thing that parses prolog, it parses and unparses prolog facts and stuff. So um, we can unparse prolog fact into some sort of simple C data structure. Um, and uh, effectively, it's RPC. So yeah, we're essentially running the prolog interpreter as a server. Now that that's uh, not too bad for the operating system. You really don't want to allow that kind of level of access to applications. We cur currently you do. Um, if you if you were actually doing this as a sort of you know proper you know commercial grade operating system for real people to use, you want to restrict the interface to actual applications. So you have CAM queries. Maybe you have a very restrictive query language that was guaranteed to be safe, guaranteed to terminate, all that kind of stuff. But inside the OS, it's just a simple message passing. You basically you construct a string. Effectively, it's like embedded SQL, okay. but not quite as clean syntactically. Okay. So the the optimizations you're doing to limit memory contention costs and so forth. It seems like there's an opportunity to take this kind of reasoning and make hardware simpler uh, because of the. <coughs> If I can do a better job of scheduling in software, then I can simplify my coherence protocols, maybe, and just rely on the software layers to do something smart. Yes. Um, are you suggesting that the hardware people put more of the problem onto the software people? Well, as a hardware person, yeah. Uh, oh, <laughs> you're a hardware person. <laughs> no, it just seems like the idea. Uh, I, I would think of it more as a, uh, you know, uh, Synergy that we could develop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, Jeff and I were talking about exercise exceptions a little while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think for it's, people it's, like you. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's hard to argue against synergy, but um, the relationship between hardware designers and operating systems people has been, uh, shall we say, a rocky one over the years. Uh, and it's basically characterized by um, the hardware people doing stupid things and the operating systems people being very passive aggressive and not complaining about it. Um, uh, I, I am exaggerating, of course. Um, I would describe it the same, it's a backwards. <laughs> okay. So, um, I think that there, there is actually a very interesting issue here, which is, um, yeah, w what should the hardware look like moving forward? And, and given that operating systems, I, I, I do think operating systems change. Hardware has tried to be compatible with existing operating systems. Existing operating systems have tried to deal with what the hardware has done, but in a sense, both have been mutually inhibitory, if you like. Um, and I think there is an opportunity, particularly when you've got things like this, or you've got other kinds of architectures of operating systems or message passing and stuff, to perhaps free up a lot of the constraints that, that slow down hardware. So, I mean, for, for us, we don't care about cache coherence. Of course, we don't write applications, that's easy. <laughs> but um, we're happy with machines that are not cache coherent but partially cache coherent um, because. Firefish just works, right? It boots on on coherent machines just fine. Um, but I think, um, and so I think, yeah, there is an opportunity there to sort of have that kind of conversation. And we are talking to some sort of hardware people about this. Um, I would like to talk more about it. Um, so. On that note, let us thank the speaker once more. <laughs>